brothers and sisters and friends, before we get started, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Holy Father in heaven, what an awesome privilege to come into your house. What a privilege it is to open up your word, the infallible word. Father, we pray that the words off the pages here we can apply to our heart, dear Father, that our minds might be open and receptive to what has to be said. Bless each person that is here. In your holy and precious Son's name we pray. Amen. What we're going to do is probably a little different than we usually do, but we are going to look at the whole book of Jonah. Steve told me that I got until 10.30, so I'm going to try to cut it a little short. What we're going to do is take the aspects of all four chapters, and we're going to pick out the highlights of it, point out where it's applicable to us. One thing about Jonah, and not many people spend much time in it, but Jonah is usually used in the VBS. They like to bring out the fish, the well, whatever it is. But when you look at overall picture, it's one of the smallest minute points of the whole four chapters. As we, we know about Jonah, he started to preach, or as a prophet, about 700 years before Christ. The book of Jonah is going to show us all the attributes of Jesus Christ, or it's going to show us the attributes of God. It's also going to highlight a lot of shortcomings. Shortcomings of man, shortcomings of Jonah, where he ran from God, he ran from God's love. A whole area is devoted to Jonah's really messing up badly. Why? Because of pride. I know nobody here in today's world ever thinks about pride, do we? That's about number one on everybody's list, I. We also think about Jonah and we think about God's salvation and what the Lord will do. And another part that applies directly to us is second chances. The Lord will always give us another chance, doesn't he? Where we stop giving second chances, he steps up and gives second chances. Now Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh? Nineveh is the capital of Syria. Nineveh was a barbaric capital of Syria. It had two walls surrounding the whole city. If you went all the way around the city, you had roughly 60 miles. It's that big. It was the largest city during the biblical times. They had two 40-foot high walls. If you could get through the first wall, you had the next one to go through. Very, very barbaric. Matter of fact, on the outside of the walls, they had human heads hanging there as a deterrent for anybody coming up to the city. You think about Jonah getting the request from God to go to Nineveh. It would be exactly like one of us getting the word to go to be in testify with the Taliban. They have absolute hatred for Jerusalem. They conquered it a couple different times. As a matter of fact, during this time, Jerusalem was paying a tax. Another thing to keep in mind is that Nineveh was 500 miles from Jerusalem. Well, what did Jonah decide to do? I'm going to run the opposite way. Tarsus was 2,000 miles in the opposite direction. Do you think 
Jonah thought he really was going to run away from the Lord? In the small book of Jonah with four chapters, we've got ten miracles. All special things that the Lord did. If you cannot look at Jonah and look at ourselves, then there's something wrong. Because there's something in every part of that book that applies directly to us. We're going to take out a few words in each one of the chapters and talk about it because it applies directly to us. The very first word we're going to look at is after Jonah received the instruction from the Lord, he went in the opposite direction. Now we have to keep in mind when you travel in Israel, the majority of the area is soft sand. Now you think how tiring it is to walk through soft sand. He had a three-day journey to Joppa to get on the boat. And what it says in here is that Jonah paid the fare. Well, what's so different about that? Number one, most important thing to keep in mind is the fact what he did was legal, but it was a sin to God. You look at our lives as we live today in 2023, how many things are legal and they're a sin? We can look at butchering unborn babies, and that is a real pet peeve to mine. Planned Parenthood, what a bunch of garbage. It's a sin. We allow it, it's a sin. Homosexuality is a sin. Sexual immorality is a sin. It's allowed, but it's a sin. It's against God. You may be able to walk into a court of law and walk away without any penalty. But you walk before the most holy throne of our Lord Jesus Christ, and there's going to be consequences to pay. So something to keep in mind, that just because it's legal, an awful lot of times it's a sin. Something else we must keep in mind, and this is a terrible, hard subject to bring into a church. Church discipline. Oh, oh no, we're kicking everybody out. Absolutely not. Church discipline is there for one reason, is to change somebody's heart and mind and bring it back and focus with the Lord. What a shame, brothers and sisters, it would be if we would allow an unrepentant person to stay in our fellowship without discipline because we're allowing them to go to straight to hell and we're condoning it. Why are we sitting here now to take a stand for him? He didn't go through hell on the cross for fun. He did it for each and every one of us. Jonah got on the boat, on the ship. And you can think, as he traveled the three days to Joppa, how much mumbling Jonah did. What in the world is this? They want me to go to Nineveh, and I hope they all perish. He got on the ship. He, he started to brag to him. They knew he was a Hebrew. He knew he was from Galilee. Most of those people were Gentiles. He bragged to them, I'm running away from the Lord. So one of the miracles, the Lord brought in a storm, and we know about that storm. It wasn't just a ripple. It was a flat-out terrible storm. The people started to get so anxious, they started to throw stuff overboard. The captain of the boat finally found Jonah 
sleeping. Jonah, get up and pray to your God, whoever it might be, to help us out. He went up on dike. People said, well, who is your God? We've been praying to all the other gods. Very calmly, Jonah said, my God created the heavens and the sea. And it stopped every one of those people. Their gods were not helping them. Jonah said, you want this to calm down? You throw me over. Throw me overboard. And the people did not want to do that because their culture said an eye for an eye. If they threw Jonah over on purpose, they were killing him. And they knew exactly what was going to happen to him. Their lives would be taken. Finally convinced him. And what's the first thing that happened? All those Gentiles got down and began to praise our Lord and Savior. He testified. He testified, and he never said a word to him. Isn't that amazing what our Lord can do? Overboard he went in this huge sea. And what did the Lord do? Another miracle. He put a large fish right below that boat. You can only think what went through Jonah's mind when he went overboard. He started to go down further and further and further. Then suddenly a large fish engulfed him. Didn't chew him, just swallowed him. Now if you think that was a pleasant ride in the belly of a fish, for three days and three nights. Can you imagine the stink that was there? Can you imagine the other food that that fish took in? I don't think he sat in the lazy boy lounger. His life was unpleasant. For three days and three nights, he was in that fish. Let's see. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was in the tomb for three days and three nights. Isn't that amazing how that worked out? What did Jonah do then? Lord, I messed up. And he gave one of the nicest prayers that could be given. Then what happened? The fish took Jonah and deposited him on the side of the water on the seashore, not in the water, over on there. How can a large fish go there without bothering me now? It can't. He threw Jonah up. Could you imagine those people that happen to be walking up and down that beach and see this happen? You don't think Jonah had a fish story to tell him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what happened? God said, okay, Jonah, now go to Nineveh. It took a little over a month of walking at 20 miles a day from that point to Nineveh. Walking every step, knowing what's going to line up for him. He's probably going to lose his life. I have to go and testify to people that I absolutely hate. But Jonah, God loves those people. You may dislike them, but God doesn't. He dislikes their sin. When he died on the cross, he died for every one of us. He didn't go through and say, I want that, that. No, everyone. Approaching closer and closer to Nineveh. How much he had anguished mentally. He walked up and saw these huge gates standing before him. And the city was a three-day journey around it. 
it was that big of a city. They figured there's roughly 600,000 people in Nineveh. Jonah walked in there and they said it's a three day journey. Three days to go around. His first day, he opened up his mouth about our Lord Jesus Christ. I give you 40 days, but the Lord's going to overtake. Oh, 40 days. That was 40 years in the desert. The people came from Egypt. In biblical times, 40 years was a generation. When it talks in the Bible about three generations, each one is approximately 40 years. We look at a generation as 100 years. Back then it was 40 years. 40. Here we go again. He preached God's word. And the Lord came through again. They were so convicted of their sin that the king over Nineveh made a proclamation. Everybody, I mean everybody, is going to have to worship the Lord. Do you think Jonah had anything to do with it? Jonah was so upset. It said that he went outside the city on the east side of the city. The Bible says the Lord's going to come from the east. Is that not something? Jonah sat down and he was flat out mad. Lord, I would rather die than to see these people change. I told you, Lord, before you sent me over here, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have compassion on these people. They're going to follow after you. I knew it. He sat down and had a strong pity party by himself. And what did the Lord do? He brought up a strong eastern wind. And then what did he do? Jonah, through all of his mumbling, the Lord miraculously had a plant grow and put him in shade. Now you're going to think, what does that do? Well, I can personally attest that while we're in Israel, in the hot summer days, and you would go in the shade, and it was automatically 20 degrees cooler. Why? I don't know, but wherever you were, you stepped in the shade and you could take a breath. Oh, Jonah started to get a little bit of his pride back, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And what did the Lord do? Brought another miracle. I'm going to send the smallest little insect, a little worm, and he's going to take all your comfort away. And after that big plant wilted and fell away, Jonah started to mumble again. Exactly, my brothers and sisters, exactly what we do. When things don't go our way, what do we do? Why me, Lord? Why? I go to church on Sunday. Why do I have to have this happen to me? Why did I have to have triple heart bypass? I don't know. I have no idea why the Lord put me through it, but he did. I can't blame him for it because he has given us every blessing we ever needed, and he poured it upon us. Like Job said, you give and you take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
And then what did the Lord say? Jonah, how dare you say something about this plant? There's 120,000 people in that city that don't know the right hand from the left hand. He was not talking about adults. He was talking about children. The Lord was concerned about everyone. How dare you find fault with me? What did Jonah do? Mumbled again. What did he do? He ran away from the love of God. Do we do that? Mm -hmm. But then you know what's so remarkable about this whole story? The story stops. We don't know whatever happened to Jonah. We never heard another word of him. We don't hear anything more of Nineveh. Can you imagine a missionary going today, spend one day and 600,000 people turn to the Lord Jesus Christ? No missionary in the world can do that. It only comes from him. He loved those terrible people. Those people that punished his chosen one. And he loved every one of them. Think about it. Do we deserve that love? No. Isn't that amazing how much he loves us? Over and over and over we sin. And over and over and over he forgives us. What a Savior. What a Lord. He can take somebody as worthless as Cal Westerhoff and save him because he loves me. Here's a challenge for the church. If we're going to go on the mission field, I don't care where. We must be united. We must learn about those people. We must know their habits. We must know their likes. And we must know their dislikes. Do you know one of the biggest complaints we got over in Israel? I'm so sick of Americans telling us that's how we do it. He said, I don't care how you do it. We're here. You're over there. The old saying, when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. True. Very true. Learn what their th habits are. And Here's a, one of the blessings I can't ever emphasize enough. We do not have the intestinal fortitude to go to the Muslim people. So what does the Lord do? He has a Muslim people come to the United States. Now, I'm not for illegal immigration. If they come aboard, follow all the rules to be part of it, what an opportunity we have to minister to them. They may look different than we do. They may do this different. They may do that different. Let us adapt to them so we can bring God's word to them. We have two different mission groups. We go off to Cincinnati and Fort Worth. Wonderful. Let's do the very best fully united as a body to bring them God's word. Do we agree with everything they do? No. But God loves them. I wrote down a couple things. And it's easy for me to talk about mission because that's where we spent the last 20 some years. 
I put down, learn about the Mennonites. Know about them. Study them. So you can blend in with them. That you can talk to them. That you can sit down with them. Another one. Hospitality to the Jones, to the missionaries. When they are able to come to the United States for some rest, welcome them with open arms. Encourage them. You know, one of the biggest blessings we had, there was one man I never met. Every birthday, he sent me an email. Happy birthday, Cal. Thank you for doing what you're doing. How he knew me, I did not know. The Lord knew I needed that. How he ever got in contact, I don't know. But every single birthday on my birthday, he didn't say, this is so, no. We have got to take our missionaries and lift them up. We have got to support them. I don't mean financially. I mean support them. Know if a missionary has a family, how many children they have. You know how encouraging it is if a missionary got a birthday or Christmas card from Mariah Hill saying, you are in our prayers. You would bring a smile to a lot of people's face. Then if we send them out, we got to support them. We have got to let our missionaries know what they're doing and how important it is for us. If I ask a simple question, how many of you would be willing to go to the Taliban and minister to them? Please raise your hand. Not too many hands go up, do they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Knowing for the fact that when you go there, you more than likely are going to give your life. But you think about it, brothers and sisters. He gave his life for us. What a small sacrifice for us to give it to him. What a blessing. Another one I put down, reach out to the Ninevehs in Fort Smith. How many different groups of people live here? I don't know. How many do we minister? Probably not very many. What did the Lord say? Go. Do my work. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing more important in all the world Nothing is more important. I am not saying that you have to stand on the street corner and scream at people. Absolutely not. Because our Lord never did that, did He? He talked to people. He healed people. And what did He tell them a lot of times? Don't tell the Pharisees. Just go home. Keep it quiet. A stranger would walk up and talk to you, and if they can't tell you are a child of the Lord, there's something wrong. My wife, as you probably know, she's a little blonde. She's as ornery as you can get. No. She's about the most blessed young lady I could ever have. And I'll never forget one time when everything was going wrong and people were screaming all around us, she kept right on working. 
And the little lady walked up, tapped her, and said, I can see Jesus at you. Think about that. She did more testifying without opening her mouth than anything else. By looking what she did. By looking what we are supposed to do. I don't want this talk to bring anybody down. But I think we have waited long enough. The Lord has waited long enough for us to stand up together and not just be a lighthouse on the south side of Fort Smith. What's wrong with being the lighthouse for the whole city of Fort Smith? What's wrong with that? Nothing. We have got one of the most welcoming groups of fellow believers there is. We have the most beautiful building you can find. We've got the best staff you can find. The Lord has blessed us with everything we need. Excellent Sunday school teachers right down there. Excellent, excellent mission group. Let our light shine. Let people come up and say, there's certainly something different about you. What is it? Nothing material. No. Everything is him. Everything. i got one last question to ask each one of you. Don't raise your hand. How many of you are Jonah? Are you going to run from the Lord? Are you going to run from the Lord's love? Lord, you're going to make me uncomfortable. Good. Be uncomfortable for him. He was more than uncomfortable for us. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Father, thank you for giving each and every one of us second and third and fourth and fifth chances. Thank you, dear Lord. I ask that we can be united as a body in Christ, to be willing to be the lighthouse in this dark, dark world. Father, thank you. In your holy and precious Son's name we pray. Amen.